Open your Bible, please, to the Gospel according to Matthew. The Gospel according to Matthew. First, let us pray. Loving Father, we thank Thee for Thy Holy Word, for the Holy Spirit, its author and our teacher. And we need not ask Thee to send Him, nor ask Him to come. Blessed Holy Spirit, we recognize Thy presence in our midst, indwelling us individually. May we have open hearts, open eyes, open ears, open minds, to receive and to retain and to respond to divine truth. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The gospel according to Matthew is the gospel of the king and his kingdom. For example, in chapter 2, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Someone recognized that the birth of this baby was the birth of a king. In chapter 3, In those days came John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye! for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's not saying that the kingdom has come. He's simply saying the kingdom is being offered to you. The king is here, and the kingdom is being offered. Chapter 4 in the Gospel according to Matthew. Verse 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven Heaven is at hand. The kingdom hasn't come, but it's being offered. And so it goes throughout the ministry of John and of our Lord. Verse 23 of chapter 4. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The king had come, and he was offering himself to the nation of Israel as their king. The offer was a valid offer. Of course, God in his omniscience knew that the leaders of Israel would reject the Lord Jesus Christ. But the offer was a valid offer, and if that troubles anyone, may I say if you're listening and you have never been born again, you have never been saved, God offers you salvation today. If you deliberately, knowingly, willingly reject the Lord Jesus Christ, God knows that. In his omniscience, he knows that. But the offer is still a valid offer. God's not toying with us when he makes available to us eternal life. It was a valid offer to Israel when our Lord came. And so throughout the entire gospel according to Matthew, this is the message. The king is here. He's offering the kingdom. When you come to chapter 12 in the gospel according to Matthew, there is what I'm going to suggest a turning point in the ministry of our Lord. Verse 22 of chapter 12, Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Now there were many common people who recognized in the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils or demons, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the demons. And what they're doing is accusing the Lord Jesus of performing miracles by the power of Satan. Now actually he was performing his miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 28, I think will make that clear. If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God. 
Now that was the turning point. And uh, it was really the point in the ministry of our Lord when I think we can say Israel had it for the time being. Verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now if anyone listening to my voice is concerned as to whether or not you have committed this sin, this is the so-called unpardonable sin. Now, that term is not in the Bible to the best of my knowledge. I've never read in the Bible the unpardonable sin. It's been coined by man and I think it's been coined on the basis of this particular portion of Scripture. But if you're wondering whether you have ever committed it, forget it, you have not. I see this sin in its setting, its dispensational setting, if you please. They were attributing the power of our Lord in performing miracles to Satan. That's the precise sin of which our Lord is dealing with. He said in verse 32, Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So that the sin in context was the sin of attributing the miracles of our Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit to the power of demons. Christ is not on earth today raising the dead, unstopping the ears of the deaf, opening the eyes of the blind. He is in heaven. I'm not saying that God is not performing miracles today. I'm simply saying the Lord Jesus is in heaven today performing a miracle, a great miracle in behalf of his own. He ever liveth to make intercession for his own. But this is the turning point. This is the break here in chapter 12. So that when you come to chapter 13, we have a change. The Lord Jesus goes out of the house and we are told in verse 1, he sat by the seaside. Now, I don't want to uh, spiritualize to uh, any large degree here, but I think we can say, by way of application, not in primary interpretation, but by way of the application, he's now making the break with Israel because the leaders have totally rejected him. He now makes the break and he sat by the seaside, which is symbolic, I believe, of the nations, the Gentile nations. And he's now going to turn from Israel, who turned from him first, who rejected him, and he's now going to present a program, a program on the earth during his absence. And so we have in chapter 13 the parables of the kingdom. Now there are three major discourses in the gospel according to Matthew. In the so-called Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5, 6, and 7, we have the principles of the kingdom. The second significant discourse in Matthew 13, we have the parables of the kingdom. And then in the Olivet Discourse in chapters 24 and 25, we have the prophecies of the king. In chapter 13, we're dealing with the parables of the kingdom. Will you please look at verse 11? He answered and said unto them, and the answer was to the question, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now the question, why do you speak in parables, came after our Lord had given the first parable of the sower, the seed, and the soils, beginning with verse 3 and going through verse 9. And they said, why do you speak unto them? Not why do you speak in parables, but why are you speaking to them in parables? To whom? Verse 2, the great multitudes. Why are you speaking to them in parables? And in answer to that question, he said, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So that the parabolic teachings of our Lord had a twofold purpose. First, to reveal truth 
to those who wanted truth, and secondly, to conceal truth from those whom he knew would steel themselves against it. To you it is given, to them it is not given. Now, at this point, let us note the term, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The word mystery does not suggest something mysterious, but rather a hitherto unrevealed secret, or a hitherto unrevealed truth. So that in these parables, our Lord is going to give some teaching. He's going to give truth that hitherto had not been given. He's going to give the secrets, if you please. And that's a better term, I think, for our understanding. The secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Now, the king had come. He had offered himself. But the nation rejected him. We will not have this man to rule over us. We have no king but Caesar. And so he's going to the cross. And he's going to tell us what form the kingdom will take during his absence. Here are hitherto unrevealed truths concerning the kingdom, the form it will take during the absence of the king and until he comes back again. Secrets. There are secret societies today in the land. Lodges. To the uninitiated, the non-members, these secrets are not known. But when one becomes a member or is initiated into that lodge, the aura of mystery disappears. And the initiated one now has the secret, the inner secrets of that lodge or that secret society. So then our Lord is going to reveal to his own the form the kingdom will take during his absence. Now, some people are troubled about this idea of the kingdom of heaven in the exposition of the parables because, for example, in the second parable you have tares. So how can you have tares in the kingdom? Or uh, if our interpretation of the leaven is correct, and I think it is, that it is not representative of good but of evil, someone will say, how can you have evil in the kingdom? Or in the last parable you have good fish and bad fish. How can you have bad fish in the kingdom? You must remember, dear friends, that the kingdom, in one sense, is any sphere over which the Lord Jesus reigns. When he said the kingdom of God is within you, I think in a spiritual sense that is true. Now we believe in a literal reign of Christ on earth. We believe that the king will come and establish his literal kingdom on earth and reign for 1,000 years. But even during that time, there will not be perfection in the hearts of the people. As we suggested last night, when the millennium begins, only saved people will enter into it. But millions will be born during the millennium who in their hearts will not surrender to the Lordship of Christ. They will not acknowledge his saviorhood and his sovereignty. So that at the end of the millennium, those who have not been saved, who are still rebelling against Christ, that will be manifest when Satan is loose, so that actually during the literal kingdom you don't have perfection in the hearts of the people. So why should we be surprised to see in these parables that there is good and evil? Now, let us look at the parables. I'm suggesting to you that there are seven, some competent, capable Men of God see eight parables in the chapter. I have no fuss with this. I do not see the eight parables in there. I see the possibility of it, and I, I can uh, have good fellowship with those who see eight, and that's no problem. But I see seven parables here in Matthew chapter 13. So that actually we have here a picture in prophecy, a preview, of some things to take place on the earth during the king's absence. Now let me say that the kingdom is not the church. The church is in that period of time, the inter-advent of Christ, from the time of his first coming to his second coming. The church is included in that time period. But the kingdom is not the church. I'm going to use a term that 
has been used for many years, and some of our friends don't like the term, but Christendom, if you please. Professing Christianity, that's involved in it. And the church is here also, but the kingdom is not the church. Now, having said that, let us look at these parables. The first parable is the parable of the sower, the seed, and the soils. Let me suggest three things concerning this first parable. First, we have the introduction, which is the parable itself in verses 3 through 9. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. He does not tell them what, he, what kind of seed he sowed. He merely says he went forth to sow. And when he sowed the seed, whatever the seed was, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness or depth of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them, but other, other seed fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. That's the introduction to the parable, verses 3 to 9. In verses 10 through 17, after the introduction, you have the interlude, the interlude. And it's quite fitting and it's in its proper place because we come thoroughly to the interpretation of the parable. The introduction, verses 3 to 9, the interlude, verses 10 through 17, in which our Lord explains the reason for his parabolic teaching here, and then the interpretation, beginning with verse 18. Now, remember that the people steal themselves against the word of God. Verse 15 says, This people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I am not willing to say that the foreknowledge of God determines the behavior of men. I'm sure God in his omniscience knew that David would commit adultery with Bathsheba, but God is not the author of David's sin. God's foreknowledge did not determine David's bad behavior. God wrote a law, thou shalt not commit adultery. I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I believe in human responsibility also. Both are in the Word of God. Somebody asked the late Charles Haddon Spurgeon if he can uh, bring these two together. He said, can you uh, take the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man and bring them together? He said, uh, they're friends. They are together. Both are found in the Word of God. Remember that the Jewish leaders, they close their eyes. They stop their ears against the truth. And so in the interlude, we have the reason for the parabolic teaching. But in the interpretation of the first parable, beginning with verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom. Now this parable was in three gospel records, Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8. And in all three parables, it is clearly, distinctly stated what the seed is. The seed is the word of God. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, the seed is the word of God. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The seed is the word of God. Now, the soils on which the seed was sown are identified in the interpretation of the parable. Notice verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. The seed is the word of God. The soils represent the human heart. Four different kinds of heart response. Four different heart reactions to the word of God. The parable is designed to teach that during the king's absence, 
there will be a great sowing of the seed. Now, the soils on which the seed was sown are identified in the interpretation of the parable. Notice verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. The seed is the word of God. The soils represent the human heart. Four different kinds of heart response. Four different heart reactions to the word of God. The parable is designed to teach that during the king's absence, there will be a great sowing of the seed. But only one out of four soils responded favorably to the seed. The ratio there is 75% rejection and 25% favorable response to the seed of God's word. Now we are not to expect a worldwide conversion. The old post-millennial idea will not stand up. We hear today a slogan, help change the world for Christ. Well, my dear people, the church is not called to change the world for Christ. 1 John 5, 18 and 19, the whole world, the whole world system lieth in the wicked one. The church's business is not to try to change the world. We're sowing the seed. That's our business. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But we are not surprised to find that there is not universal response worldwide response, worldwide revival. You say you're a pessimist. Well, if I'm a pessimist, then Jesus is a pessimist. Because he stated in the parable that during his absence, this is the form the kingdom would take. The seed would be sown. But 75% of the hearers would not respond favorably to it. Why not? Well, in the context of the interpretation, there are three enemies militating against the word. First of all, there is the wicked one, verse 19. That's the devil. The wicked one. Verse 21, the one heart had no root in himself. Underline that self. Verse 22, he also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So that going from the last to the first, you have the world in verse 22, the flesh in verse 21, and the devil in verse 19. This is seed sowing time. But three enemies will be militating against the word of God, while the king is absent, and we are living in that period. The world, the external foe of God and his word. The flesh, the internal foe of God and his word. And the devil, the infernal foe of God and his word. Now all three are active, militating against the truth of God. Now we're not to be discouraged. Keep sowing the seed. Thank God for the 25%. But the world will never be converted while we wait for the king to return. That is the basically the substance in parable number one. We'll not go into a detailed study of the various types of hearts here and why they did not respond. Let's move on to parable Number two. Now from the first parable we learn that the seed will be sown during the king's absence. But we are not to expect 100% response to the preaching and teaching of the word of God. Now let me make a statement here before we go to parable number two. And that is in my understanding of these parables, there is consistency in in the teaching of all seven. They are designed to teach the course and the character and the consummation of that time period until the king comes back. We are living in that period. 
There can't be any contradiction here. All seven are designed to teach the same thing. So if one teaches something different from the others, then there's inconsistency. They are not in harmony, but they are in harmony. There is continuity, there is consistency. Keep that in mind as you study all seven. We come now to this second parable, which is the parable of the tares. Parable number one, there will be no universal reception of the gospel. The church will not bring in the kingdom. Uh, even the church in its present form is not perfect. And if you wonder why it isn't perfect, it's because you and I are a part of it. I meet disgruntled church tramps who are always nitpicking and finding something wrong with their church. They're in a good conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching, gospel-preaching church, and they're unhappy. They find some little thing they don't like, some peculiarity or idiosyncrasy about the pastor or something, and they want to look for another church. Well, if you're fishing around for a perfect church, I beg of you, if you find it, please do not join it, because you will wreck it as soon as you get in it. It will cease to be perfect. Keep that in mind. No, no, no. The church itself is not perfect. In the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, which in my judgment parallel these seven parables, I think you're finding the same kind of teaching. You find there that uh, there's a lot of good in the church. But even in the first church, you can't have a utopia because with all of the goodness of that church in Ephesus, our Lord said, I have something against you. You left your first love. You had a hot heart for God, a hot heart for his word, a hot heart for Christ, <coughs> a warm heart for lost souls. But the honeymoon was over too soon. You left your first love. You read those seven letters. You'll find why the church cannot bring in the kingdom. Now parable number two, beginning with verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now you have in parable number two, two sowers, two sowings, and two seeds. In parable number one, the seed is the word of God. In parable number two, the seed is not the word of God. The seed happens to be people. If you will turn over to the interpretation of parable number two, beginning with verse 38, and our Lord gives this in answer to the disciples in verse 36, who said, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Parable number one, the seed is the word of God. Parable number two, the seed represents people. And the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. You say, in the kingdom? Of course. In the literal millennium on earth that will be true. Not all children born during the millennium, as I said and repeat, will be saved. At the end of the millennium, when the devil is loose, the children of the devil will be there. Now, many will be lovers of the Lord Jesus, servants of the Lord Jesus, but many will not in the literal kingdom. So don't be surprised in the parables when you find the enemy sowing tares in the mystery form of the kingdom. You have then two sowers, two seeds, two sowings, and two seeds. Now, I think the history of civilization is a history of the seeds. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where we have what the late Arthur Pink called the seed plot of the Bible, you have the battle of the seeds. God speaking to the devil said, I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. 
The battle of the seeds is the history of civilization. The seeds are people. Now, in the first parable, those who respond to the truth are in the minority. They're in the 25 percent. The majority rejected the seed of the word of God. So we are not to be surprised in parable number two if the children of the devil outnumber the children of the kingdom. This is a grand audience for an early morning service. I'm a poor judge of crowds. I would say not less than if this auditorium seats 2,500, we have at least 2,000 people here. Marvelous. But beloved friends, we are a drop in the bucket compared with this great population of this tremendous city. Go out and do a little personal work. Talk to people. Find out how many people know what it means experientially to be born again. The Lord referred to his own as the little flock. But now in parable number two, the enemy uses a different method. He applies a different method entirely. It's the method of imitation. This is important in our study of the parable. Let's look at it again, beginning with verse 26. He said in verse 25 that while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Now, let me pause here to say that there has to be a clever likeness of the authentic. The spurious wheat must have resembled the authentic so closely that the householder said, no, no, no. You may not be able to detect the one from the other. You leave it alone. You may destroy some wheat with the tares. Let both grow together until the harvest. Now, in the interpretation of the parable, beginning with verse um, 39, he said, The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end, not of the world, but the end of the age. And that'll be the age marked by the second coming of Christ to the earth, the coming back of the king. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this age. Now there's a similarity here. Remember, dear friends, the devil is not an innovator. He is an imitator. And his imitations are like the authentic. Therefore I submit to you, they are chiefly in the area of religion. You know that some poor victim of alcohol in the gutter is a child of the devil. You know that a prostitute is a child of the devil. You know that murderers and thieves are children of the devil. No difficulty identifying that crowd. But here they are mixed with the wheat. And the counterfeit is so clever that even the servants are sometimes unable to determine the spurious from the real. He said, you let them alone. At the end of the age, I'll take care of that. I think one of the cleverest works of Satan, as the age runs its course and we approach the end, is his clever counterfeit in the area of religion. We have many religions today, and they're not Eastern Oriental religions, religions in the Western world that will quote the Bible, use the name of Jesus. Are you not aware of the fact that every religion in the Western world hangs its doctrine on a Bible text? 
And many of them will carry Bibles. And some soft-headed, untaught Christians can't tell one from the other. Now there's a way to detect the spurious. But there are many people who can't tell the difference. It's in the area of religion. Now, let me just draw your attention to the third major discourse of our Lord in Matthew chapter 24. And we'll conclude our meditation here and continue, God willing, at my next session. The Olivet Discourse, chapter 24, verse 3. As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world or the age? That's the consummation of the age, the full consummation of the age. And of course, in the context, it's the age marked by the Great Tribulation, which is the return of the king to establish his kingdom. Jesus answered and said unto them, now he doesn't give the total answer in Matthew. You have to go to Luke to get some of the answer. But he said in verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. Verse 5, he brings the deception right down to a specific area. He said, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You see the counterfeit? Verse 11, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Verse 24, don't miss this one, in conclusion. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs or miracles and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now, of course, these will be the elect of the tribulation. God has always had his elect. Israel was God's elect in the old economy. The church is God's elect today. But think of it, performing miracles in the name of Jesus. Wonders and signs in the name of Jesus, prophesying in the name of Jesus. As the age runs its course, you'll see the counterfeit, so much like the authentic. Now, how can we detect the real from the counterfeit? Well, you master the authentic. You become men and women of the Word. Live in the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Study the Word of God. Saturate your mind and heart with the Word of God. Beloved friends, we can never get too much Bible. This is the authentic, and it's the only way to detect the spurious. We'll take up from that point in our next study. Father, bless thy word to every heart. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.